Well, welcome everyone to IREI Live. If our hosts and panelists would join me by turning on your cameras and microphones right now, that would be a wonderful thing. So allow me to introduce myself. Um, I'm Jeffrey Dorman, President and CEO of Institutional Real Estate Inc. And this is the second in a series of live webinars produced by IREI and sponsored by the panelists who, be, who will be presenting to you today. Uh, and I'd like to start by thanking our program sponsors for stepping up and underwriting the cost of producing these webinars because they really enable us to engage in lively discussions about issues that are critically important to the audiences we serve. And they also enable you as, as members of the audience to engage in dialogue through using your chat function, which Loretta will explain in a few minutes, um, to communicate with these people. These program sponsors include Artemis Real Estate Partners, Clarion Partners, Elyon Partners, Mosser Capital, and Juniper Square. I'd also obviously like to thank our panelists and plan sponsor participants, and they'll be introduced in a minute. Today's edition of IREI Live focuses on DEI or diversity, equity, and inclusion. And we have more than 300 people signed up to join us today and or to view the recording later when it becomes available. Um, DEI has become really to the forefront of our attention over the past 12 months, I think stimulated in large part by the backlash created from the death of George Floyd and others. But investor concerns about these issues are not new. Back in the 1980s, as early as the early 1980s, Sue and Bob Twigo, who were the founders of the Institute for Fiduciary Education, took a look around the room, the meeting rooms for the programs they were producing at the time, and realized they were looking at the faces of a lot of middle-aged white, mostly Anglo-Saxon men. They called them hasty white-faced guys. And realizing that the beneficiaries of the pension funds, endowments, and foundations that most of these investment manager types were serving were a lot more diverse than that, they started the Minority Fellowship Program to help give people of color a leg up. Um, that program now is known as the Twigo Foundation. Maybe you've heard of it. Uh, gender diversity and equality also have long been an issue uh, for us as well. Um, Nori Gerardo, one of the founders of PCA's real estate consulting practice, wrote an article for us about the glass ceiling for women, which she styled as the pink ghetto uh, several years ago. And the women's tea tradition at Priya and our own VIP conferences were really designed to enable women in the business to connect with one another and support and advance their mutual career interests. And Crew, commercial real estate woman, was founded for a similar purpose. And then a few years ago, Priya instigated its own programs to advance the issue of diversity in the business, including fellowship, scholarship, and mentorship programs, which uh, a lot of firms contributed millions of dollars to support. And several consulting organizations like Alliance Global Advisors, um, Felix Weiner Consulting Group and the Real Estate Limited Partnership Institute and others are also now focusing on helping firms develop formal DEI focused programs. The industry, however, particularly on the investment management side of the business with few exceptions continues to be dominated at the top by largely white middle-aged men. So not much has changed. Um, and more than a handful of public pension funds have initiated emerging manager programs recently to give emerging women and minority owned firms a leg up. Unfortunately, um, it hasn't been easy for these kind of firms. Many feel that not only do they have to meet the normal selection criteria employed to screen out potential new investment managers, but because they're owned by women in the minorities and because of the optics of not wanting to appear to be giving preferences, um, they feel a lot of times these firms have to jump through several additional hoops. So it's even more difficult for them to break into the industry, not easier, despite the efforts to make it easier. I think in the meantime, what's happened is investors have really grown tired of waiting and are now demanding that their investment managers start demonstrating that they're taking the issue of DEI seriously and are doing something about it and not just talking about it or make, making donations in favor of it. In other words, put up or shut up is what basically you're saying. So what everybody's starting to ask questions uh, about are things like, what are the benefits of pursuing greater diversity, equality, and equity, and inclusion at our organization? Uh, what do we stand to gain? And, and what does best practices in the areas of DEI look like today? And what are some of the things we shouldn't be doing that would be perceived as merely window dressing or whitewashing rather than making a serious stab at addressing these issues? Should we develop a written DEI policy? Where do we find the qualified talent among people of color or ethnicity? You know, how do we find people? There aren't 
that many that have made it into the industry to begin with. And then how can we promote their interest and elevate them in our organizations, give them the opportunity to move up? And how can we encourage more women, more minorities to pursue careers in this business? And finally, how do we identify, acknowledge, and conquer our own internal biases and prejudices um, um, that may have been getting in the way all along? So these are just some of the issues that we can explore today. So to introduce our panel, and explain how you can pose questions to the panelists through the program. Allow me to introduce our host for today's program, Loretta Klotfelder, who's the editor of Institutional Real Estate America and frequent co-host for our editorial advisory board meetings in the Americas region, as well as for our VIP Americas conferences. Loretta, it's your show, take over. Thank you, Jeff, and thank you for that introduction. I, I think that really sets the sets the tone for what we're gonna what we're gonna be talking about today, which you is you know, where are we and and where are we going as an industry, um, which will be what we talk about on this first panel. I'm gonna start things off by uh, introducing the panelists and uh, giving them the opportunity to tell us a little bit about themselves and their organization before we get things going. And then at about the halfway mark, um, you and the audience, I'm going to invite you to uh, use the Q&A function to ask questions of our panelists, and I will then direct those questions to our to our panelists. Um, so again, uh, let me kick things off and start with Gina Baker Chambers. Thanks, Loretta. Uh, I'm Gina Baker Chambers, uh, Principal and Portfolio Manager at Artemis Real Estate Partners. Artemis is a majority women-owned real estate investment manager, um, investing across the risk spectrum from core, core plus through value and opportunistic, uh, US only across all product types. And about half of our AUM is committed to uh, partnering with emerging and diverse real estate operators. Dave Kataya. And I think you're muted right now, Dave. All right, the wonders of technology, Loretta. 18 months and we're still learning, right? <laughs> um, th thank you, Loretta, Jeff, and John, and the REI team for highlighting diversity, equity, and inclusion in real estate. I'm Dave Kataya, and I'm head of HR at Clarion Partners. I'm also an equity partner in the firm. We manage about 59 billion of AUM, similar to Artemis, and we have offices across the US and Europe. Uh, I've spent my entire career in financial services, um, sporting private equity and public uh, equity firms, and I've had the, the great pleasure of serving on many D and I, as they used to call them, councils. And, you know, I look forward to a really good and robust discussion today about DEI in real estate. Angela Miller May. Good morning, um, and thank you, IREI. Um, I'm Angela Miller May, the Chief Investment Officer for Chicago Teachers Pension Fund. I joined the fund in 2010. Um, Chicago Teachers is a $12.5 billion pension fund that services over 88,000 Chicago public school teachers, active and retired. Um, the fund is currently 46% funded um, and our actuarial rate of return is 6.75. Uh, we invest across most asset classes, but for this discussion, 9% um, in real estate and 2% and in infrastructure. And my focus at the fund has really been to strengthen the portfolio, um, increase returns um, and total assets um, by selecting strong managers um, and increasing diversification and also um, CTPF's asset management diversity. Wonderful, and Nevio Mosser. Yes, I'm Nebio Mosser. Thank you also, um, Chairman of Mosser Capital Management and Mosser Companies. Uh, we've been in the workforce housing arena in California for uh, almost six decades now. I've been, been a part of it for about four. Um, we're in our, we specialize in providing quality workforce housing uh, throughout the state. Thank you. And, you know, I think the, the first question we, we want to talk about is, you know, where, where the industry is right now um, and where we're going. And I want to actually, I want to, I want to talk to, to you, Dave, about something that you, you actually kind of referenced in your intro, which was uh, you've been working in DEI since before it was DEI, since it was just D and I. Why is the equity piece 
um, an important addition to these issues? It, you know, that, that, that's a good question, uh, Loretta, and, you know, an excellent, an excellent starting point. So, you know, the, the real estate industry is extremely varied, right, when it comes to DEI practices. And when I reflect on my career in, in asset management on the public security side, DNI was really pronounced, where the focus was really on demographics, right? A numbers game and inclusion. How, how do you meet, make people feel included and excited when they come to work? But there are many, many driving forces behind the I component. And the I is you know, becoming a lot more prominent in our discussions around DEI. And, and I believe we've had sort of this you know, social awakening um, in the last year or so, where we've seen a lot of social justice issues in the US. And, and I think more and more companies are asking themselves, you know, what, what can we do, right? And what can we do differently to make people feel like they have what we call an equal playing field, right? So when we talk about diversity inclusion, one key concept that's left out is the E, right? The equity piece. And equity really refers to, you know, a state where everyone, regardless of your background, right? And your background could be your ethnicity, your gender, your sexual orientation, your country of origin, your age, disability. We know the list, right? Um, a key piece also in financial services, based on my humble observation, is education, right? Whether you've attended an Ivy League school or whether you've attended a city school, right? Um, and, and do you have an equal playing field at work and in broader society? Um, you know, when, when diversity, equity, and inclusion are integrated, you know, people are more connected, emotionally connected to your firm, right? And when they see that they have access to equity, then they feel they can then, you know, give you a larger level of contribution. So when we look at equity, we look at two things, right? You're trying to achieve two things. Um, one is financial capital. Are all people getting the same and comparable access to financial rewards? And two, I would say the second one is what I would call social capital. And social capital is where everyone feel like they have the same opportunities to speak at investment committee, to be heard at a management committee team meeting when they submit a resume that there is no connotation you know, behind their names. When you, know, you meet with someone who is different from you that they're evaluating you on the same criteria. I could go on a soapbox, but I'll stop there. I know we have an hour. <laughs> it's a great start. It's a great start. And I, I think I'm going to go over to Gina and, and ask you again also, you know, where do you see where the industry is today versus where we need to go? Well, we are what the numbers say, right? So with respect to at least uh, management of capital, you know, we're sort of less than 2% for minority managers. We're less than 1% for women-owned managers. And you know, you would presumably think there's nowhere to go but up from those numbers. Uh, and so, but I also believe wholeheartedly that if we don't set a target or a goal, we're not going to move. Um, and, you know, is 5% enough? Is 10% enough? I'd probably argue no, right? I want to be greedy. I want more of that. But at the same time, we need to start somewhere. Uh, and 2% and 1% are just, you know, abominable numbers when you look at the underlying beneficiaries of those dollars. And it's greater than 1% and greater than 2% from a women in a minority perspective. And so let's do what we can to ensure that the, those underlying beneficiaries of the capital that we're investing have folks who uh, might have a similar or shared experience or background, you know, putting those dollars to work because they're going to bring a different perspective to how to invest those dollars that could generate some alpha for an underlying portfolio. Your mention of underlying beneficiaries, I think, is a, a really good one. And I, I want to go over to Angela for that because, you know, you you represent the the teachers of Chicago. So, you know, why why does DEI matter for for what you do at Chicago Teachers and for the people you represent for your beneficiaries? 
Sure, and um, Gina touched on something really quickly. Um, it, it totally matters to Chicago teachers um, and it has mattered since 1990 um, when we started our diversity uh, program and policies. Um, and Chicago Teachers has been a leader um, in encouraging diversity and inclusion by ensuring that invest, investment firms, diverse investment firms can conduct business with the fund. And, you know, when we talk about numbers, you know, currently we invest 48% uh, of our total assets with minorities, uh, women, and uh, persons with disabilities um, owned firms. And, you know, the question is, you know, where does it stop, you know, and 20% is our goal um, through our Illinois pension um, code, but, you know, we want to reflect our, our members, you know, and our members are diverse, as you can imagine, and our trustees are diverse, and our organization is diverse. So we want to reflect those numbers, um, whether it's 48% or more or less, but it should be aligned with the people um, that are contributing to the pension fund. And they wanna see their, their pensions um, managed by managers that are reflective of them. Um, I, I think it's a part of our fiduciary duty um, to invest money prudently. And I think investing with uh, diverse managers um, is a part of our responsibility. And, uh, and I want to go to, to Nevio and, and ask you, you know, you mentioned 40 years in this industry. Um, where, where is, you know, what, what sort of, what have you seen over your career about, you know, and where we are now versus where we're going? Um, can you give a little insight here? Uh, towards, uh, just to clarify, and that's towards the uh, DEI or yes. uh, more, um, you know, we've been, you know, before I would say uh, DEI has been a framework of my family and our business uh, for the whole 60 years of my father started the, the company. Uh, we are a predominantly woman and uh, minority owned company, uh, privately held. We've had, I say, 87% of our employees or members of our organization are people of color. Um, with that, we find for us is that we were, we consider what we consider to be our workforce housing model. Um, and we are, you know, we're not just buying property. We are becoming stewards and members of a community. And by going ahead and hiring people and mentoring people from these communities and giving them a, an ability to rise up within our vertically integrated com our company, they take, we've seen a, uh, a lot more pride in the actual uh, within our employees on how they're affecting change within not only a property, but within the communities that we serve, that we serve. I think, I think um, your, your mention of hiring is a, is an interesting, interesting angle. And I, I want to go over to, to Dave because you're in HR. Uh, that's an important role. And how, how do you think about that uh, shaping the future of the firm as you're going about your, your hiring? You know, how do you, how are you developing careers? Um, so a couple of things, uh, you know, our CEO says you, you have to do what's best for the greater good of the industry. So our first focus is, you know, how do we, how do we identify the, the, the next generation of real estate professionals or, you know, future uh, workforce of, of America or the globe, right? And, and real estate has has always been sort of at the back burner of financial services because we're not, you know, sexy traders on Wall Street, right? Uh, so, so we are trying to find ways how we can represent real estate careers as compelling career options. And to do that, you have to start at the high school level and then at the college level. And, and to get there, you do it in a couple of ways, right? Through education, through mentorship, you know, through sponsorship. Some of my colleagues already referenced some of the sponsorships that, you know, some of our, you know, real estate asset management firms are um, supporting. Uh, but when, when it comes to careers at your firm, um, you know, that's, that's the challenge, right? Because we've had 
uh, a limited candidate pool. And, and it's not an excuse, it's really an observation. And, and the US is producing, you know, more women MBA candidates, you know, than men. And, and yet, you know, women in, in senior positions represent, you know, fewer, you know, graduates than men. Uh, so, so we, you know, so we've made a concerted effort to create what we call a career management committee, and and our argument is on on a weekly basis uh, we meet to review uh, our investments, right? So we have an investment committee, and and we we talk, we do underwriting, and we go through this entire process, and we we say people are our best assets, and yet you know, very few companies spend the focus time and concerted effort to review their people. So at our firm, you know, several years ago, uh, we, we established what we call a career management committee where, you know, we ask all of our employees for what we call aspirational goals, right? Tell us what you'd like to do. And then we review your, your skill set, we review your skill gaps, and, and then we try to build you know, develop an opportunities to get you to where you need to go. Um, a big focus of that, and I'm coming to your question, is focusing on women, right? Particularly women and underrepresented groups, right? People of color. And our focus has been, how do we get people from the junior levels into the, the more senior ranks, if you will? And not only the senior ranks, but, you know, how do we get people who have been, you know, historically underrepresented into our investment committee, into our operating committee, into our executive board. And there has to be focus, there has to be action, and there has to be leadership commitment. Does, um, do, do, does anyone else want to weigh in on, on that or respond to, to what Dave's describing? Gina, Nevio? Gina? I mean, I'll just add with respect to, you know, I, I concur on high school and college, but we also have to face the reality that at the entry level, we do have relative gender balance coming into the junior level roles. Um, we're just probably 15 to 20 ish percent on the underrepresented minority, but we're losing those folks along the way. So what can we be doing through the middle for additional cultivation, mentorship, sponsorship? to ensure that you're not losing 20% of the women, right? So you start at 40% at the junior levels and you're at 20% once you get to sort of almost senior management and then you're probably at 10% for the executive level. So where what's the missing piece, right? Which is a question you haven't asked yet, but that's why you need buy-in all throughout the organization. Because if, if your HR team or your recruitment team does a great job bringing folks in at the junior level, if they don't have anyone to look to aspire to become, or they don't have the support to be staffed on the appropriate projects and deals, you know, we are going to lose them and they're not going to be our future senior leaders. So as just a caution to everyone who is really going very long on the high school, very long on the college, what are you doing to support the junior folks in their uh, growth uh, as they work their way through your organization? Right, indeed. Can I, can I add? Please. Um, I guess from the perspective of, of being a chief investment officer, I look at it, you know, as also creating a succession for the next CIO to be a diverse person as well. And I, I try to create a clear path to this role and mentor those that are interested by first building uh, a diverse team and having that pipeline come through the investment team itself and then trying to encourage, um, whether it be an analyst or a portfolio manager to really kind of get out of the, their comfort zone. Um, because when they start, they want to specialize in the asset class. And I think, you know, in being a CIO and understanding what it takes to do that, there needs to be more than just, you know, focusing in on real estate or focusing in on private equity or public equities but having a, a broader view of investments. And those are some of the things that I, I try to implement in my coaching or in the mentoring um, and trying to keep the team engaged, even now as we're sitting at home trying to, to be a team. So those are, are some things that I think are important and, 
and encouraging uh, continued learning and development um, of your skill set. Mm -hmm. And I, I think your your point about about the this particular period we are we are in where where we're in this pandemic. I I want to come back around to that because I think there are some interesting interesting elements there. Um, but but from a from a you know sort of a, a bigger question, you know where where do we need to go? Um, Gina, you you said let's let's get beyond one and two percent. Um, what what kind of a vision do each of you have about what the future of the industry could be? And um, maybe I'll start with with Nevio. What what do you see the the possibility of the future? Possibilities of, of the future um, are could be incredible. Um, I think it's it just taking the, the the statement that we just heard from uh, Angela and from, and from Gina. Um, the, the, there are so many opportunities that are within this field. And this field, as we've seen over the years, um, has been not representative or not really a true representative uh, from an employee base as compared to uh, when you look at your man uh, management and or the communities that we serve. Um, I think it's, you know, I, I find personally myself that I spend, you know, while well, I've I've been doing this for a very long time. I'm not, I don't think I'll ever retire, but I see how my career is changing and it's going from being more deal and acquisition and growth oriented, but it's changing so internally with myself and then some of my key, uh, key team members to be more of mentoring and how we're going into communities and providing opportunities uh, for people to come in and see that, hey, there's an, an amazing career path that can be taken in many different sectors of our business. Um, so I find myself being more of a mentor. And it's actually much more, it's much, I find it much more rewarding um, per, being a person of color and, and didn't always live on the, on, the, on the good side of the tracks. Um, it's a responsibility that we all have is to, is to go out into our communities and provide those avenues of opportunities and continue coaching upwards so that we're not having a situation where you have lower level employees or, um, or uh, more manual employees of, particularly of, 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 of the, that are more mono-ethnic, but as the management uh, levels increase, it changes and you lose them. And so how we internally going forward, promote um, you know, DEI and not just do it because this is the thing to do, but to live it, practice it on a daily basis is, is important and critical for us. I see, I see you nodding there, Gina. Yeah, no, I com I completely agree. I mean, I, I think it, it's twofold, right? So I kind of dove in of the who's managing the money and the, the one and two percent, but the other piece is what do your what does your organization look like? And Nevio and Angela's comments are spot on. You have two leader diverse leaders of organizations who it's ingrained in how they are treating um, their team building and cultivation and mentorship and sponsorship. And we sort of need to ensure we have that same level of commitment from majority organizations and that they recognize that there should be someone or a voice or voices amongst their inner circle that are helping them think through, you know, the, the ideas of recruit, where do we recruit, right? SEO is wonderful. Twigo is wonderful. Um, you know, the IVs are, are excellent. What's your HBCU plan, right? And are you going beyond Howard and Morehouse and Spelman, because there's a whole bunch of others that are wonderful, right? There's Hampton, there's FAMU, there's North Carolina AT. So it's just being expansive about, you know, where we can find talent because there's a lot of talent out there, just not equally cultivated. And so I think, you know, looking at the examples of, of Mosser and Chicago teachers, you know, it is possible to, to develop a, a diverse, you know, well-functioning, well-run, high-return organization. Indeed, and I know you know part of what Artemis does is is work with emerging managers. Do you do you find this to be something that you're that you're encouraging throughout the the firms you work with? Oh, absolutely. I mean, we I'd say the bulk of our portfolio is diverse diverse owned or led organizations, and for those that aren't, we're looking for um, you know we're looking for you to lean in, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase. And we will help you do that. You know, we will help you think about how to expand your networks, how to think about different networks, um, how to think about, you know, equity, right? Is there anyone who's on a potential equity track? And what can we do to support 
that person getting to that level where you feel comfortable doing that? Um, can we negotiate it into our specific deal? And so maybe you're not ready for them to buy in at the management company level, but if they're going to be a key person on the deal that we're doing together, we want them to benefit. And that's ultimately going to benefit your platform. And so structuring those kinds of, of you know, economics uh, on the front end is something that we would do as well. So we are, um, you know, we like to say we want to be more than just a capital partner. We also want to be a strategic partner. And that's the, those things we can help you think through. I, I want to go to Angela as well on this because you know one of the things that, that we spoke about was that you know you, at Chicago you have a lot of um, you have a lot of questions you you ask for a lot of data and information about the DEI practices. Can you just describe a little bit about what it is that you are looking for when you speak with with managers and you know what what what's important when you're looking at this information. Well, I think, you know, we're, we're looking to see um, if the manager's uh, values are really aligned with ours, um, whether, you know, and, and we, we collect so much data, whether it's through EEOC tables, where we're looking for a baseline for improvement, um, or, you know, just looking at the relationships that the managers have, you know, and, um, not only looking at, um, we really want to see, you know, that diversity exists um, in the firm, not just at the investment relationship role or the business development role, but at decision making roles, you know, whether it's the director or the chief investment officer or portfolio manager. Um, and we look at this information year to year. Um, and we've been really, you know, asking for this since 2014. So now we have a lot of data to really kind of compare and contrast on an annual basis, what's going on, you know, at that firm. Um, we also ask for the ILPA questionnaire, the, the ILPA diversity template. Um, we've, you know, engaged with Morningstar to collect some standard data um, because all of the Illinois pension funds have to have this data. So we're looking for efficient ways um, for both ourselves and for the managers to submit this information. Um, and we try to meet the managers where they are. You know, it's not going to happen overnight. Um, and we look for, you know, proven um, efforts to improve on these numbers and to improve the initiatives. You know, whether it is changing your practices or policies around recruiting, hiring, um, promoting practices, um, what vendors or suppliers you're utilizing, um, whether you're uh, stressing um, more diversity on the boards of companies that you have majority um, stakes in or, or through internships um, and scholarships and uh, promoting investment education to high school students or college students. So we're, we're asking for a lot and we're, we're looking for a lot. Um, and then we're evaluating a lot, you know, when in these numbers, what, what does it tell us? Does it, does it tell us that, okay, you're good at hiring diverse, you know, candidates, but at some point there's a ceiling and they're, they're leaving in droves. Like what, what is it about your culture that's not inclusive? Um, and I think you have to have both. You have to look at diversity, but you also have to be inclusive to make sure that you can retain individuals. Yeah, retention, I think, is, is a big piece and one that doesn't necessarily come up as often in this conversation, but I think is, a, is an important element. Um, does any, do anyone else want to weigh in on what Angela just said? I'd invite. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll, Loretta, I'll, I'll add, you know, that demographics and, and, and measuring demographics has been a real challenge in our industry, right? It's really difficult to get good quality data. So for investment managers, you know, we have to determine what, what the right benchmark is and, you know, what our goals are and how are we performing relative to our clients' expectations, right? How are we performing uh, relative to our peer groups? Uh, and when we say perform, I mean the level of hiring, the level of retention, and you know the level of, of 
promotion for people of color and, and for women. And, and, you know, and I just hope as a public service message here today is that, you know, more and more of our counterparts would be willing to share data uh, because, you know, absent data, it's really hard to tell how well you're doing. Uh, unlike, you know, college enrollment or college graduation level where there is data transparency, um, you know, it's a little bit of a black box, but, but you, you need to look at your own data and, and create your own benchmark and create aspirational goals, you know, absent anything more methodical or scientific. And I just want to mention uh, to those of you watching, um, you can submit questions through our Q&A feature. In fact, I've had a couple come in already. So I want to, uh, to ask a few of these of, of the panel. Um, one question, and, and I think I will can leave this open to everyone. Do you have any tips on retention aside from mentoring? You know, how do you, what, what are the, what do you need to do there to retain diverse uh, employees? You know, speaking for an employer, right? I mean, there are, there are a variety of things you can do, right? One is showing a career path, um, showing examples of success at your firm, right? Having really good role models that others can emulate or, you know, there's sort of a North Star, you know, performer at your firm or performers, right? So you show from, from day one that, there are opportunities to, to sit in a seat that you, you aspire for to, you know, creating the right benefits for people to stay. Uh, our workforce is changing, um, creating career opportunities. So the job you want might not be available tomorrow, but are we willing to be creative as a firm and give you a position that will augment your existing skills, right? And, and position you for that role that you aspire for. So giving people stretch opportunities when the role that they want might not be imminent, right? And you give them encouragement and an opportunity to show that that role is coming for you. And also, you know, the composition of your senior team, senior meaning where are the decisions made? right? Where are the investment decisions made? Where are the portfolio decisions made? Are, are, are people like myself, you know, are part of those decisions, right? And, and I, I think once you, you, you have those markers, I, I think people will be more emotionally connected to your firm. I'm going to, I've got another question. I'm going to direct this one to Angela. Um, is it important for financial services or real estate firms to have a chief diversity officer? I think it is important, but I think um, it can't be just the role of the chief diversity officer. You, you can't hire a chief diversity officer and think you've solved all of the problems for your organization. It is something that, you know, the chief diversity officer can help with, can provide tools with, but diversity has to be across the organization, across the operations, um, structural, uh, um, systematic uh, type of processes that whether you have a diversity officer or not, um, whether your leadership is pushing diversity or encouraging diversity or not, it, it gets ingrained in the organization and the culture. And so I, I think um, having one is um, a benefit, um, but it is not something that one person can do on their own. It has to, to be contagious kind of across the organization. And I, I think um, if I can just add on to what Dave said, you know, uh, besides all of those things, you have to, in order to retain um, be empathetic and understand what motivates the team or diverse teams um, and approach um, different people in different ways because we all bring different values, but just differently. And I think, you know, in understanding what a diversity officer does is, is just really trying to capitalize on everyone's differences and bring value to the organization through those differences, if that makes sense. It does, it does. And if, if a firm does have a, a chief diversity officer, and I think this is one of the real challenges, what would be the best 
you know, reporting structure to ensure that, you know, rep within that, you know, like where, where do they need to be in the, in the organization to ensure uh, accountability? I think they should be part of the senior leadership team, like reporting directly to the C CEO or director, like it, it shouldn't be, I'm, I'm sorry, Dave, it shouldn't be a subset of HR. No, I agree. Um, but it, it should be aligned along with all of the other leaders, whether it's the CIO or the CFO. Um, it's important and it should be treated as if it is as important as your finances or your investments um, or, you know, any your chief technology officer, any of, of those areas. Sorry, I had a tickle in my throat and I I, a <laughs> I, I thought I froze. I was like, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm like over here moving. <laughs> live and live has uh, its own its own challenges. Um, for all of you, how do you see ESG and DEI tying together? Anyone want to weigh in on that? I can start, uh, <laughs> um, you know, Chicago Teachers has really been focused on diversity and inclusion, which I feel like is the S of ESG. Um, and we really consider um, ESG factors um, inclusive of diversity, equity, and inclusion data as providing um, increased information for us and metrics uh, to foster really uh, better investment decisions um, that are really key for risk management and as well as value creation. Um, and I think it begins with that initial due diligence, um, really focusing on key issues uh, such as environmental management, um, data privacy, um, so many ESG where I would think fall under the E and the, the G, but um, alongside with diversity and inclusion. And I think all of these areas together um, really you know, require risk management and include opportunities for us to bring more value to the organization. So I think it should be considered um, really uh, similar, if not uh, just the mirror side of ESG. Indeed. I wanna, I wanna bring uh, Innevio on this topic as well. You know, one of the things that you talked about was having stakeholders um, in the community. How do you see DEI fitting into ESG from a from a community perspective um, in your in your place? They go they go hand in hand, and it's it's uh, you know DEI is an integrated uh, integral part of ESG. Um, I say, as far as answering your um, pushing your question, um, how we do this in the community is our our company and uh, and our, our stewards and our, become stewards in the communities that we operate in. We whether it's what we do from um, you know uh, lower level employees and their engagement in these communities, what we do or who we do collaborations with in the communities we operate in, whether the nonprofits that we steer to, uh, our employees to go ahead and volunteer at, or where we make reinvestments uh, into charitable organizations, or how we help we come into certain um, lower income communities and partner with young uh, entrepreneurs that might be lacking in capital to help them get started in creating new retail or ground floor uh, retail op, uh, uh, businesses. I think that's important for us. Um, you know, we're in it, we're, we are long-term holders of real estate for the most part within our, within our company and family. And how we see, how we use that to help increase opportunities in the communities, how we help improve the, the communities. Um, you know, we look at it as a, it's not just a, what we say, it's what we do. And when you're able to go ahead and participate and create that level of pride, not only for myself, but that level of pride for whether it's my portfolio managers, or asset managers, that they're engaged and they're spending less time in the office and more time in the communities, walking, walking properties, seeing what's out there and then being engaged uh, is very important for us. I have a 
question, I have a question in for Dave. And just a reminder, you can submit questions through the Q&A feature. Dave, do you measure equitability among employee compensation, specifically in regard to minorities? And if so, how would you suggest a company identify pay gaps and implement a correction where needed? Okay, so that, that is a super complicated question, right? That we may not have uh, time to discuss here, but I'm happy to answer that offline with, with whomever asked that question uh, because there's some you know, analysis and complicated analysis that you have to do. But to answer your question, yes, yes, we do. We, we actually, as part of our compensation process annually and, and semi-annually. In some cases, we conduct pay equity analysis um, through a variety of lenses, if you will. One, uh, uh, you know, gender pay analysis, and we look for gaps. Uh, and we also look for, um, you know, minority or people of color pay gaps. So we look at like positions against like positions. And the reason why I said, you know, this is probably a little more complicated because you're looking at a number of factors um, when you're looking at any gap analysis, right? But you're looking for also commonalities. And we do that on, on an annual basis when we determine compensation to ensure that, you know, people with comparable skills and comparable, comparable performance are getting, you know, paid very comparably. And uh, I want to have a question for Gina. Um, do you think diversity targets benefit certain asset classes within real estate um, or certain strategies more than others? You know, you evaluate a lot of other, a lot of small firms. Do you see that sort of challenge? Um, I think if you do it at a strategy level, it could make sense. Um, diversity targets would be challenging if you sort of took it down to the product type level, right? So there are some product types with, where it's going to be more challenging to find diversity, um, industrial being one of them. Um, so I'm excited that Juan of Elian is on the next panel. Uh, he's probably one of a handful of Black or Latinx uh, owners in the industrial space. And so to say, let's do a target of X in industrial could be unrealistic. Um, but to say overall for our portfolio, we should have this, you know, wide target. I think that that's prudent, um, but I, I don't, I wouldn't take it down to the property type level, but I would certainly place some level of target similar to what Angela mentioned for Chicago teachers, you know, at the portfolio level, it could, it, it makes sense to have one. That way, you know what you're working toward. How, uh, here's another question from the audience. How do you define a successful integration of diversity, inclusion, and belonging within your respective organizations and for the industry overall? Um, maybe I'll start off with Dave and maybe a few of you can weigh in on that. Oh, oh, sorry, you froze for a second, Loretta. Great, let me, let me, let me ask that question again. Yeah. How do you define a successful integration of diversity, inclusion, and belonging within your respective organizations and for the industry overall? Okay. So you, you first have to define, you know, your goal, right? That's, that's sort of the first step. What are you trying to accomplish, right? Whether it's a practical goal or an aspirational goal, that's sort of the why when you're thinking of a diversity framework. And, and, and to determine if you're successful, you kind of have to have a framework uh, because you have to understand what am I tracking to, right? And, you know, the second one is what is the why? Like, why are we doing it? Is it a business imperative? Is it a moral imperative? Are our clients forcing us, you know, to do certain things? Or we want to do it because, you know, we care and we want to act on our care. Right. And the third one is the who, right? Who's accountable for your diversity plan? Uh, so having the goal, having actions associated with those goals and having people be responsible for it is the first step, right? You identify the responsible parties and two, you measure through retention, right? And through employee engagement, when people come to work, do they feel excited? Do they feel like they belong? And when they do, 
do they stay with you? And, and that's, you know, a really good measure. Anybody else want to want to comment on that? I have a I have a question I want to direct to Gina. How do you incorporate DEI into the fundraising process? and or encourage DEI with potential investors who may not have active policies in place? Yeah, great question. Uh, so taking the second question first, um, you really, you have to lead with performance. Um, and I think if you can show that you have performance that is um, you know, better than, or at least in line with the appropriate benchmark for your strategy, then that helps you then make the argument that one of the things that differentiates your strategy, your approach is your diversity and define what that is. Like just being a woman or just being a woman of color or just being a person of color in and of itself doesn't necessarily give you an edge or a different, different way of thinking. But if you are, if that experience informs your approach to building your team to the way you, you approach your strategy, then that's a helpful talking point that goes side by side with your performance. And that's really the way to try to open the door for that conversation with that investor who um, is agnostic on diversity or has just never really thought about diversity. Um, and I, I think the way you integrate it into your fundraising process, um, if you're you know, from the GP side, is really just to look around at your organization. Um, if you are a diverse manager, you know, sort of check that box. But if you're not, you know, who are you um, bringing into the process of meeting with investors who, you know, don't just bring a random person who doesn't touch assets, but if you're giving people opportunities and they are your lead multifamily professional or your lead office person, you know, maybe you should incorporate them into your, your meetings and so that people can see the depth of your team uh, and the diversity of your team, whether that be gender or racial or, you know, education, maybe that's a person that, you know, went to University of Maryland, right? They didn't go to UVA or Harvard or, you know, name the school. And that's another way of sort of breaking down a barrier and saying, this is a very talented person that's helping to drive that NOI, that's producing these, you know, excellent uh, IRRs that we hope will stand up against that you know, manager in your portfolio and hopefully create a space for us. Anyone else want to weigh in on, on the fundraising question or working with investors who do not have a DEI policy per se? I think um, if I could just uh, comment and take it back to defining success, if you know, we're looking at diversity and inclusion as a strategy, as if you would look at any other strategy, then performance, um, increased returns, um, the diversification of a portfolio are ways that you can define the, the success of having more diversity or more diverse strategies in the portfolio. You know, I'd also want to just add this, and add just that it's always been, performance has always been the mm -hmm. leader, um, at least, and I, I, to be honest, in my 40 years of, uh, in the field, um, really issues of DEI are uh, with either our investors or uh, financial institutions that we do business with, um, have really only come to the forefront over the last two, three, two to three years. And, um, it's almost, it's kind of, it's, it's sort of a little weird at times where people, you know, you work with people for a long period of time and they go, they see that the benefit of, you know, they, they, they always recognize our, our performance, but then it's this sort of like, um, oh, yeah, aren't you black? And it's like, uh, yeah, I've been black for four, I've been black for eight years. Uh, but why is it like now something that's, you know, uh, that's, that's, that's it, uh, there's a, why is it now coming up? You know, because it's always been in you know in our family and how we you know, my children and with my people I coach, and it's always about performance and how you work hard and then performance with these uh, with being given opportunities is uh, what's really critical for us. And I think I think the performance piece um, that actually leads into another question we have from the audience, which is about um, 
you know, in how to, what are, is there a way to encourage the industry to diversify its sources, its sources of workforce? You know, they, they make the point that um, JP Morgan analysts are highly coveted, but if all of your analysts are coming from the same background, what kind of diversity of thinking do you get? And so, you know, so much of what I think drives, what can drive the, the high returns is, is a diversity of thinking and a diverse from these different backgrounds. So, you know, how do you encourage the, the industry to diversify where, where it's recruiting people? Just have to start. <laughs> I mean, if you know everyone's going to the JP Morgan well, go to a different well. Uh, you know, my background is completely non-traditional for the seat in which I sit today. <laughs> you know, I started as an analyst at Fannie Mae, uh, pre-GFC. It's just a, a very different path, um, you know, and, and because of that, that motivated my decision to go get my MBA, but where I, you know, then spent a summer at GE. But again, decided that, you know, being for a multi, you know, national, you know, very large firm wasn't for me. So I just think if you feel like everyone's going to the same places, there's somewhere that people aren't going and you should run in that direction and see what the talent pool looks like. And it really, we just have to get out of the herd mentality, right? Because you might be uh, a leader in identifying a new you know, area of, of fantastic talent. Um, and so I would just say, don't be afraid to be the first to go to a new pool. And I think you have to you have to resist the urge to do what everyone else is doing, right? And I and I think organizations like SEO is helping us to facilitate that because they're going to different sources of universities to recruit the next generation of talent, um, and and that's just one of the feeders we have. But you know we we do have to get creative and we do have to be more open minded about you know where talent is coming from. Um, when you're thinking about, you know, how you're factoring in DEI at your organizations, how, how do you address, um, how do you factor unconscious bias into addressing that? Because I think, I think that might be something, you know, a, a lot of the people in the industry, um, there may be more unconscious bias versus overt, you know, bias. How do you, how do you address these issues? I think um, we, yeah. I'm sorry. I, I feel like we, we all have uh, biases and um, I think the, the unconscious bias training um, is really beneficial for, for everyone. It, it helps you to be more self-aware and recognize when you're having those biases. And I, I think it goes back to the last question, you know, um, how do you, find a good analyst that is not coming from JP Morgan. Like, well, you look beyond, you know, that, that position and you look into the, the skills that you're really looking for, you know, whether it's problem solving or being analytical, like, you know, it, it doesn't necessarily have to be a finance major or, you know, um, a, a person that is, you know, a, a math major, economics major, there are so many other um, careers and, and majors that give you that skill set and a different experience and background that may be helpful in that role. I think, you know, it should be factored into your recruiting, into your hiring process, your promotion process. Um, it should transcend the organization when you're selecting managers um, and really just, you know, looking at any obstacles that can be eliminated um, that are obstacles that you're creating yourself. Um, and so I, I think, you know, it is just really about looking at the value that a person can bring and trying to control or manage the biases that that you have and everybody has them, so. Gina, it looked like you also wanted to weigh in here. Yeah, I agree with everything Angela said. I think the training is, is beneficial for everyone because we do all come with some level of unconscious bias. They're just, they're gonna be different and informed by our own experiences. I think also if you can 
create a culture or cultivate a culture that allows different voices to be respected, right? So there, there might be a subject matter or a candidate or a topic up for discussion where I might internally say, okay, I, I, am, and I am coming to you with my perspective as a Black woman specifically, not just as an Artemis employee. And I think there needs to be times when people can do that, bring their whole self to an issue or to a topic without fear of reprisal or repercussion and, and know that they will be heard and that it will be valued. Now, it doesn't mean that what you say is going to be implemented or they're going to run with it, but, but you feel heard, valued, and you have that safe space to do it and then continue you know, to move on with your life after you've said whatever you needed to say. Dave? Yeah, I agree with Angela and Gina, right? Training is super important, um, but you can't stop a training, right? You, you have to examine your frameworks and how you attract people, how you promote them, how you train them, and how you inculcate them into your culture. Um, it can't, you know, it's a continuum, right? It, it continues until retirement, hopefully. And uh, Neville, any comments? Um, you know, I, I was just, I was listening to everything that was being said and it just, it was ringing, it was all, you know, it's ringing true to, uh, to me. Um, it's really, you know, I think for uh, looking internally, it's, you know, how do we go ahead and, and uh, from being more, you know, inclusive, but in the, in, in from our employee standpoint and how we develop teams that are, uh, or our DEI team um, and how we rotate people in and out of that and how we kind of, and actually what we looked at doing is pulling away from having senior leadership being on that DEI team. We, have, we work hand in hand with that team, but it's representing 16, pe 16 people from all aspects of our organization. And, uh, you know, they get together, they meet, they come up with ideas, they shape our mission statement, they talk about how we can go ahead and better serve uh, not only better serve our employees, but better serve our communities. And and not just, I think it's important for, for all leadership is not to just give a lip service and to look at that. This is a very important integ integral part of a, a company's success and a community's success is how we're able to go ahead and to encourage that participation at all levels of an organization. Right. I know we're, we're coming to toward the end of our of our uh, of our hour so i want to just take a moment to kind of give each of you the opportunity to to share kind of your final thoughts and and takeaways and what you want the what you want our our audience what do you want the the listeners to to kind of leave today with um so i'm going to start with gina so what what do you hope what do you hope people will will take away from from today's conversation i am hopeful that people will set a goal, a measurable goal, whatever that is for you, and pursue it, right? It could be a hiring related goal. It can be just implementing an unco unconscious bias training, something that you can measure and hold yourself accountable to. And if you don't achieve it, what does that mean for you going forward? Dave? I would just like to remind my colleagues that, you know, creating an equitable and inclusive culture has no end date. And we have to be relentless and we have to be engaged and we have to be circumspect in what we do and how we do it. And Nevia? How we go ahead, I think, and uh, think outside of the box and move away from what's been traditional uh, uh, industry norms and be willing to embrace and recognize uh, the benefits of DEI, not only from a uh, cultural, uh, financial aspect, but from all aspects of the organization and our community that we operate in. And to take the time to go ahead and to uh, put in the hard work um, and to spread that out, speak the speak, you know, walk the talk, walk the talk, um, and to promote that within your company is important for us as a, not only as an industry, but as a country in itself. And, and Angela? 
I guess I would I would want to first acknowledge that there are firms and organizations that have been making changes. Um, but I, I also think the industry as a whole needs to implement effective solutions um, to really, you know, work at because I don't think we'll ever resolve the issue of diversity and, and inequities um, in the industry and, and to ensure that those processes and policies um, and any of the recent actions that they have uh, committed to are, are actions that are gonna be sustainable and not just reactions um, that come out of the events of the, the last year. Um, and I, I think organizational leaders um, have to be visionaries and have to set the example from the top and set those policies um, and measure the organization against those policies and hold themselves accountable. I, I want to um, I want to thank each of the panelists. Um, thank you, Angela. Thank you, Dave. Thank you, Gina. Thank you, Nevio. You know, I think this panel has been um, really helpful um, and in in sort of setting the stage and talking about what what kind of DEI issues we have. Um, what sort of what sort of plans and framework might be might be necessary? Uh, we will take a short break after this, and we will be um, returning at uh, eleven twenty Pacific time to have a second panel where we're going to go into some of the more um, maybe some of the more nitty gritty about those questions that that were mentioned about measuring and benchmarks and framework, um, so that we can really continue this conversation. Um, for those of you who are asking questions, if your question has not been asked, uh, we will carry them on to the next panel, um, and hopefully we can keep this conversation going. Again, thank you to our to Nevio, Angela, Gina, Dave. Uh, this has been a wonderful conversation. We really appreciate it, and uh, now we'll go into a short break. Hello and welcome to our second panel of today's IREI Live, Making It Happen, DEI Best Practices. Um, in this second panel, we are going to get into some of the, the details about how making that, how we might make that happen um, and uh, look forward to, to having that conversation. First, I'm going to uh, introduce the panelists, um, give them the opportunity to tell us a little bit about their role and their organization. I'm going to start with uh, Juan. Thank you, Loretta. It's uh, great to be here with uh, everyone speaking about this important subject. Uh, Juan de Angulo, I'm a managing partner at Elian Partners. Uh, we're a minority owned, vertically integrated uh, manager focused in the industrial space. And um, we are both a fiduciary and operator managing real estate assets uh, around the country. So excited to be a part of this today. Julie? Good morning, Loretta. Good morning, everyone, as well. Uh, Julie Donegan, I'm a portfolio manager in the real estate team at CalSTRS, uh, which is the world's largest educator only pension fund. And we serve roughly 1 million California educators, retirees, and their beneficiaries. Um, our pension plan actually closed an all time high yesterday, just over 300 billion, 308 to be exact. And our real estate investments comprise roughly 12% of that, so 37 billion. And uh, we're just slightly under target at 12%, uh, with our goal being a 14% of the total fund in real estate. And Jennifer? Great, thank you, Loretta. Uh, my name is Jennifer Stevens. I'm a co-founder and managing partner of Alliance Global Advisors. Our firm is focused on developing growth-oriented solutions for investment managers. And we do so through the elevation of best practices. We launched our business on April 1st, 2020. Um, and in that short time, we have advised uh, investment management organizations with over $130 billion of real assets under management. So looking forward to the conversation today. Thank you for having us. I think the first place I'd like to start is um, to ask you, you know, so you've been following along with the first panel and uh, 
one actually called me out because he was like, well, now I'm going to have to pay attention. Yes, you are. Um, <laughs> do you have any reactions or comments regarding what you've seen so far? And I'm going to put one on the hot seat. <laughs> I expected that, Loretta. Um, you know, first of all, just uh, a genuine respect uh, and admiration for, for those that have been doing this for a very long time and that have been serving ESG and DEI, not from a place of strategy or, or from a place of, of uh, sort of following a trend that is occurring, but really just second nature uh, as it should be. And, and I just felt a tremendous amount of respect for the groundwork that has been laid that, that gives us a great opportunity to, to really make a difference now. Uh, clearly we have a lot of ground to cover still and, and to create a truly equal field out there. Jen? Yeah, I think, um, you know, we all have a lot to learn from one another. So we were paying attention, as you recommended, during the first panel sessions. Um, two of the comments that really stood out to me specifically, um, where I don't think we have enough industry guidance, um, the first was a question that Dave answered. Um, he was asked a question about compensation surveys, particularly um, on the topic of pay equity analysis. And while I think the industry is in you know, pretty much agreement on the fact that compensation surveys should be conducted routinely, probably every three years at a minimum, I think his firm uh, Clarion conducts them every year, um, at least once a year. Um, the question about pay equity analysis is really something that we haven't um, come to terms with. Um, it's very complicated. It involves combining organizational leadership, culture, and legal. Um, and so I think that um, for that reason, there needs to be a little bit more emphasis that's placed on, on this topic of discussion to provide the industry with guidance. And then I also love Gina's comment about bringing your diverse talent to the forefront of investor presentations and allowing them to meet your key stakeholders, because I do see a pretty strong correlation between DEI culture and succession planning and retention. So I love that she incorporated that in her comments. And Julie. Absolutely. I, I also took a lot away from Gina's comments and what really stuck out for me was the fact that we are losing so many women and persons of color from the coming into the door and then being a junior or senior levels of the organization, we're leaving, we're leaving half of those folks are going out the door. So the retention is key. And I think it's great we're focusing on how do we reach out to networks that are not traditional, universities that are not traditional, reaching into high school areas and having these mentorship programs to show folks and expose people to careers in private equity real estate. But it needs to go beyond that because if we're losing half of our talent pool in that middle section, our pipeline is vastly diminished. We need to figure out why that's happening. And I think Jen hit on it. I think Gina hit on it. If you can't feel that you're part of the conversation, or if you feel that you don't have a seat at the table, or even something as simple as, you know, you can't be what you can't see. If there's not a role model that's ahead of you, that's senior in the organization, that you have a defined path that you say, I can follow that person and I can be promoted. And th that will be there for me when I am ready and trained and wanting to be promoted. If that's not happening, that's a, that's a key driver of why folks are leaving because they're saying, you know what, I'm looking ahead of me. There's no room for me to go. No one looks like me. No one has my background. I'm just going to leave. And think of all the time and energy we put into recruitment to just have folks walk out the door. It's such a waste. Absolutely. So with that, with that sort of framework with that background, you know, let's talk about maybe some examples of initiatives that are being employed to help move the needle uh, in the industry today. Um, I'm going to start with you, Jen. I know you, you're aware of a lot of stuff going on. Maybe you could kind of run down some of the, some of the initiatives. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is a lot going on in the industry. Um, in fact, we're tracking about 35 to 40 different industry working groups that, um, uh, and four separate pledges um, that are focused on diversity, equity, and inclusion. Many of them are specific to real assets, but some span asset classes. Um, and then in addition to Alliance, our firm, um, there are other groups that have been collaborating within the industry to better understand these DEI initiatives. So 
Um, amongst a couple uh, groups that are focused on collaboration, we have spoken recently to the Real Estate Executive Council, to Twigo, to the PREA Foundation, uh, IREI, and then um, a few other groups. There's one interesting group that's developed um, across the investment management organizations. It's, it's going by the name Project Elevation. And the efforts of Project Elevation are to bring investment management professionals together in one setting um, to discuss challenges and opportunities within DEI across their organizations. Um, in uh, later commentary, I can highlight some of the other ones um, that have been standing out that are aiming to collect information and set benchmarking objectives across the industry as a whole. And uh, Julie, I wonder if you could weigh in with the investor perspective on seeing a lot of these initiatives happen and, and what kind of, what, what role you might want to, to see the industry take. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I echo Angela's comments that she shared earlier. You know, we are fiduciaries and we need to represent not only our constituents in terms of our internal staff, so at CalSTRS, but we also need to recognize and hire managers that are equally diverse. So I think as an institutional investor, and while I'm new to the CalSTRS team, I'm very proud that CalSTRS has been focused on diversity for over 20 years. And what that really means is we continue to push our managers, publicly traded money managers, and of those that we do business with to expand their diversity program, portfolio manager level, executive levels, discussing how we can remove some of those hurdles and improve diversity and have a set of actionable goals and measure them similar to what um, Angela mentioned. You know, you can't manage what you can't measure. So we have to put these goals in place so that we can continue to make a difference, especially when you have large amounts of capital that you can make investments and tend to, and you can potentially move the needle. And I'll, I'll touch on that later in my conversation. But I think the key takeaway here is that CalSTRS is not afraid to ask for diversity data from its managers. And if you're a good manager, you should recognize the importance of DEI and be ready and prepared to have that conversation. And it could be as simple as when you're going to meet with an institutional investor, why not put little photos on your org chart? Let me see what your team looks like, more than just a name. Let me see if you have women or person of color. What does your team look like? If it's just a you know, a traditional org chart with names, it, it doesn't really highlight what you do well. And if you are a diverse manager, that's a really great quick way to show your investors, hey, this is who we are, look at our team. And you could see right away how diverse they are. Oh, Juan, uh, what, what, what do you have from the, from more of a manager perspective on the same question about the initiatives that you're seeing? Well, first of all, for us, uh, all of the partners in the company are, are from Hispanic descent, and uh, all of us have a very non-traditional path um, to, to have gotten to where we sit today. And I think as we look back over the last more than 10 years and building out the firm, uh, inclusion and diversity uh, has been something that has come second nature to us, maybe because of our background or, or the process that we took to get here. Um, and, and have very personal stories of overcoming some of those limitations that are out there in order to really get to the point that we are very fortunate to be at today. Um, so carrying that perspective forward, when you start to uh, have institutional investors um, and you start to put policies and programs in place, um, it is a, a, a very delicate process of choosing uh, what you sign up for, what are the programs that you profess that you follow, because you want to take those very seriously and you want to be able uh, to stand up to the scrutiny of, of the uh, underwriting process that a CalSTRS or an Artemis or others will put you through. Um, so to that end, and I preface my comments with saying that because it is a challenge today in the industry in terms of uh, understanding what are the different programs that are out there, what you should you be signing up for. Uh, as, as it relates to us, uh, we, we were became uh, signatories recently for the CEO Action for Diversity and Inclusion, which we found to be uh, a very uh, reasonable set of guidelines. Obviously, uh, we are very impressed with what some organizations like the PREA Foundation and Twigo have done in the past already, and we are looking for ways to get more and more engaged with them. 
Um, but, but just generally speaking, that's what we've seen out there. We're constantly getting educated. Uh, we're fortunate to, uh, to work with, with great folks out there that can help uh, get us information as we continue to navigate these waters. But as a manager, it's challenging, right? Where you wanna be able to really point to, this is what we say we're doing, this is what we are doing. And so going through that process is, is not an easy one. Yeah, I see you nodding, Jen. I know a big part of what you do is consulting with managers. What kind of advice do you give them around these issues? Sure. Well, it's it's about a few things. So, so one of the challenges facing managers today are the number of questionnaires coming their way. So one thing that um, I think we aim to do is kind of to boil down to the key questions that should be asked on various topics and really promote best practices when it comes to those topics. Um, there are also collaborative efforts underway to limit the types of due diligence questionnaires and the types of ongoing um, data and measurement requirements that the managers may face. But we really try to help boil down to, you know, what's important, what can be specifically tailored to your organization to help you move the needle forward and contribute to building a more inclusive industry as a whole. So I'm really encouraged by the fact that over the last 12 months, we have seen a 100% increase in the number of diversity, equity, and inclusion questionnaires that have come our way. Um, very encouraged by that because that means all of the key stakeholders are involved. It's the managers, the investors, and the consultants. Um, a little bit discouraged that all of these questions look the same and there's not, uh, but they're all slightly different. There's not a lot of uniformity, but as I mentioned, there are, are efforts underway to collaborate. And then um, finally, just um, really working together as opposed to being competitive about diversity and who's winning this game, working together to win as an industry, I think could help move the ball forward in a way that we haven't done before. So, um, so we're advising managers in many different ways. We're helping them set up diversity, equity, and inclusion policies or incorporate that within their ESG policies. And more importantly, set up a framework for implementing that and changing things over time within their organizations. Yeah, I, 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 I wonder if you find this to be sort of a similar process to maybe what the industry was like 10, 15 years ago around ESG and, and how that sort of became a little bit more standardized over time, Dan. I do. Um, I do think it's very similar. Um, what I hope evolves is a more manageable process for reporting key information to um, build a better and more diverse workforce. I think, um, you know, I contributed to the creation of some of those ESG questionnaires. And, and part of this is about finding a way to make, um, you know, make this a more efficient process for the investors and the managers alike. So I hope to see some differences in this evolution of DEI questionnaires, but I do see a lot of similar similarities in the trajectory and just the overall support that this topic has garnered. I wanna to go to, to Julie. Um, looking at this from the investor's perspective, you know, how do you see, how do you see these, um, these sort of metrics and measurements? How do you see it fitting into your due diligence? Um, maybe, you know, I don't know if you wanna reference Calister specifically or maybe the industry as a whole. Yeah, sure, no, absolutely. As I mentioned, Previously, you know, you can't manage what you, you're not measuring. So I think it is just as important as your performance data. And to the extent that I don't think, I know the prior panel touched on it, you know, there is the business case to be made for diversity in terms of we have seen time and time again, more diverse teams have equal, if not stronger, investment performance. So it is a, a piece that has to be added on to any traditional due diligence questionnaire. And I agree with Jen completely. It's all over the map. I've seen the DDQ questions and I can't imagine being a small shop and trying to address every single nuance. So I think, yes, yeah, standardization across the industry is absolutely critical. And I would say the same, even with ESG, that it's getting more consolidated, but you know, I'll just do a slight, slightly tangent here. We did a review of our managers on ESG specifically and there were more than 300 different groups touting themselves as the way to measure or the way to show that they are actively doing ESG right. So I think we need to have that in mind as well for DEI that needs to be 
very uniform across the board so that people can actively spend their time wisely and you know answer the right questions and not have a bunch of busy work. So I think first and foremost, it needs to be part of a traditional due diligence process. It needs to be just as important as uh, performance data. And we need to look at what these teams are providing in terms of diversity and um, potential inclusion in the decision-making process. And you know, I'll just touch on some of the, the bigger industry metrics overall. There was a report that this came out and roughly 32% of the companies in the Russell 1000 disclose some level of race or ethnicity data about their employees. And just 6% of those companies provide further level of data, intersectional data on gender or race or ethnicity. So these are all very key questions, but I think it, it also ties back to, you know, what are we allowed to disclose? Are there legal limitations on asking employees? Do you have them self-identify on these questionnaires? It gets a little murky when you actually get, you know, the rubber meets the road and how do you disclose those numbers because you have to be mindful of HR limitations as well. I see, I see you nodding through that one. Uh, do you wanna weigh in from the manager side on, on these questionnaires? Yeah, look, I think I, the obvious uh, uh, point is that it'll make it a lot easier for the manager to be able to uh, respond to the due diligence requests from the investors. Uh, but uh, to Julie's point, which is a very good one, uh, as you are a, a growing company and you're mindful about compliance with HR policies um, and, and with creating a culture of, of inclusion and diversity, uh, you have to be mindful of complying on both sides, providing that information, making sure that you're remaining compliant with, with your team members and respectful of their choices and their lives. So it's all a very delicate process, but uh, one, one of the things that we feel as we go through diligence processes, um, definitely having something more standardized maybe will make the investors more able to just get to the information that they really want to know. Because sometimes we almost feel like in the beginning of the process, even the investors are a little bit shy about what they're asking for. And they're, they're not as straight or, or not as direct, I, I, I guess is the right word, uh, with, with what they want to know because it's, it's being handled in a more uh, intangible way. So I think creating these processes will really help both the investor and the managers to be able to communicate. What, what questions should investors be asking during the due diligence process um, that they aren't already asking? Um, or at least some, some investors, maybe, maybe Calsters is asking them, but, but other investors aren't. Um, maybe I'll, I'll start with Juan. Sure. I, you know, when, 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 um, when uh, I thought about this, I, I really, what jumps out at me is that a culture of inclusion makes you a better investor. So it's not a, just about doing the right thing, but as an investor, if you're evaluating an organization uh, for how do they go about their process of making an investment decision, and that doesn't end going in, it's also how do you continue to evaluate a, an asset's performance? How do you continue to evaluate the right time to exit if it is the right time to exit, if that's your strategy? A culture of inclusion is, is pivotal. And, and really you have to peel a lot of layers within an organization in a diligence process to be able to truly familiarize yourself if that culture of inclusion exists. Do people feel like there is a safe environment to speak up and to provide uh, their opinion about what might be going on as it relates to an investment or to the organization? So. Uh, for us, you know, we really feel that that our team is our greatest asset, and and I think over time in a diligence process, an investor gets to naturally um, inter, inter uh, relate with a lot of the different team members. So I think naturally that ends up coming out, uh, but but I don't see investors on the immediately coming in requesting to interact with a lot of different team members for the purposes of figuring out if there's a true culture of inclusion. Absolutely. Jen? Yeah, um, I echo Juan's comments. Um, last year, actually, about a year ago, we published a blog on this topic. So what questions aren't being asked in due diligence related to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And that really stemmed from 
Um, admittedly, a moment of self-reflection for me. I wrote an ESG questionnaire in my prior rule. Um, it did not have um, diversity, equity, and inclusion questions in that questionnaire. And I really sat back to think about what we could be doing to change the industry in a way that's positive. So we developed a list of about 25 questions that could be asked during due diligence. A couple of them I'll point out here, but you can visit the website to read it. Um, first, you know, has the manager that you're considering um, built in more inclusive language in very simple areas of documents, key person provisions as opposed to key man provisions? Um, are they, when publishing job responsibilities or, or job descriptions, are they uh, building in language about the inclusivity of their work environment? Um, you know, one idea that I always think about is how are new ideas and perspectives introduced to senior leadership positions? So is investment committee introducing diversity of thought in a routine and procedured way? Um, is management committee um, bringing in new perspectives from time to time? And then finally, um, really one that's not on the blog because it came about more recently, I had a conversation with a, um, a trusted group of female professionals in our industry and somebody made the comment about return to work and they said, uh, this came from one of the managers in their portfolio, if, if, if you want a job, you may continue to work remotely. If you want a career, you will return to the office. So I started thinking about how return to work rates across different demographics, um, across different levels of par parental demographics could impact um, diversity in a way we haven't thought about. So start tracking that information, um, track your parental return to work rates post COVID to see if there are any patterns that you can change. And just thinking outside the box a little bit, um, asking new questions, I think will go a long way in improving um, our analysis here. And and Julie, what, what do you, um you know, it's sort of a trick question because you are an investor, but what investor, what questions could investors or should they be asking that they're not asking? Well, I, I agree with Jen's comments. I mean, one of the things that we focused on at CalSTRS is looking at our position descriptions and the language that's being used to describe these jobs. We've identified them as potentially being masculine leaning. And, you know, are we inherently excluding folks from even applying based upon just the simple use of words to describe our jobs. So I think there's a lot that goes into it. And if we start with that as the, the premise of how else can we be inclusive? You know, are we asking folks what pronouns would you like to be referred to? You know, there are many, many ways that just language alone can make someone feel that they're uh, much more part of the team and inclusive. But I'm definitely going to go to your uh, website, Jen, and look at all those questions. You know, I think underpinning that, you know, I just described some language concepts, and it was discussed in the prior panel. I also think there's unconscious bias and unconscious bias training. And we could clearly ask managers, do you have a training? Do you make this available to your team members? And, you know, the next corollary would be, you know, what is the retention of your staff? Do you have folks who are staying in the organization five or 10 years, all of which would speak to how inclusive is your culture and do people feel like they have a voice and do they have a defined career path where they can see progression? So I think it, it's all intermixed, but very important. And I want to take this moment to uh, invite our participants, our audience to weigh in. If you have any questions or comments, we have a Q&A button um, and I'll be sharing those. I do have one question, and I think this is one that that um, can kind of build off of where we are in the conversation. And this is about, um, given that Asian Americans are not a monolith, you know, is there space to discuss how Asian Americans might be discriminated against in the real estate finance and investment space within these DEI discussions? Do you think that the, I think what they're asking is, is it possible the DEI discussion itself can lack inclusivity sometimes? And how do you broaden that conversation? Um, I'll take I'll take a stab at that. Um, I do have an opinion on that. So I think it's really prevalent for firms that have a global presence as well um, to understand how to track um, diversity across their workforce and differences in their workforce composition. Um, I do think in different groups that are more represented than others that there can be some unconscious bias. And listen, unconscious bias 
it's not limited to a group of white males. Everybody has unconscious biases and that's what the training really helps to bring out. And so I think that there is a way to kind of look through to the composition of our workforce and what we may be doing to better understand how our practices and um, you know, and policies are, are negatively impacting a certain group. And there are um, across those 35 to 40 organizations, um, a number of organizations that focus on um, different demographics and supporting um, those demographics through a network. And more and more, I'm seeing managers post job positions within those groups and try to cast a wider net when it comes to recruitment, which I think is ultimately a positive thing. But there are definitely, um, you know, there are, are practices that lean um, to favor one group of people over another and just trying to mitigate those practices going forward, I think is our, our main challenge. You mentioned uh, casting a wider net during recruitment. Um, are there any um, suggestions or best practices you might have on around that topic? Uh, I'll, I'll leave it to all of you, but, but maybe start with you, Jennifer. Yeah, I mean, I think a lot of executive level positions um, go through the same recruitment channels and some of those searches could be more closed door than what would be preferential to cast a wider net. So we recommend when searching for senior leaders within the organization, everywhere from senior leaders and executive level positions down to analysts and administrative assistants that you're actually reaching a different audience than you have before. The past panel touched on this, but even publishing um, positions to KO um, or to REEC, um, the Real Estate Executive Council, or to Twigo. Um, there are really some talented individuals coming through those networks that you might eliminate if you're running through a closed door recruitment channel. And, um, you know, I think that the recruiters obviously serve a very important role, but thinking outside the box and widening the net, I think, can help capture a broader audience. Absolutely. Uh, Julie? Yeah, absolutely. You know, I'll take the opposite end of the, the spectrum, Jen, not so much the, the senior executives, but the beginnings of the pipeline. You know, we've been very fortunate to have Priya SEO interns at CalSTRS and they are amazing. You would be blown away with the level of talent. I encourage everyone, get involved with the Priya SEO, have those interns in your organization. Um, everyone that's come through the CalSTRS channel uh, has ended up with a job in a professional position in private equity real estate. And I think there, that's just one way that you can start to make a difference, more of the entry level pipeline. And these uh, candidates come from very diverse backgrounds, uh, a very different pool of educational opportunities, and they, they are amazing. So I think leaning in more toward the PREA SEO uh, internship program would, would be amazing. A one? Well, I'll say that it's great um, to, uh, to hear some of these uh, sources because as a group that is, is growing uh, quickly and, and uh, we are in desperate need of help and, and finding talented people, um, it is not always easy to really know where to go uh, to, to find uh, qualified uh, young people uh, at well at all levels of the organization, right? Whether you're finding a, a senior person or or entry level folks, and uh, knowing that there's other sources of, of 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 places that we can tap to that talent is is very important. But what came to my mind with your question, Loretta, that I'd like to mention is as a manager, I think uh, there's been a process of really I don't want to get too esoteric here, but uh, of really learning to know ourselves. Um, and I think the more you are, you develop awareness within the organization of what you stand for and what are the values that are important to you and not sort of at a, at a um, uh, just a descriptive way, but genuinely what is your corporate culture all about and what is it that is most important to you, you become much better at recruiting uh, and at retaining because you, you hopefully start to uh, address the cultural aspect first and not leaving it towards the end of the interview as a check the box to see if in the process you found somebody that really fit. Um, and so when you address inclusion, uh, you need to bring people that are going to thrive in that type of culture. You know, believe it or not, we have found that there were people that really did not fit well in a, cult in a culture of inclusion where it is expected that you're going to 
uh, provide your opinion and that you're going to express your thoughts. Um, and, and there are people that like to maybe uh, not, not be in that culture. And so just really knowing yourself, what you stand for and what you're, what you're looking to, to attract is, is a, as much as important as it is where you go to find the talent. You, you mentioned corporate culture. How, how, how do you go about being more deliberate in creating a culture versus just sort of bumbling into whatever, whatever culture is, you know, modeled by the, the CEO founder type, you know, how, how do you deliberately create a, a more inclusive corporate culture? Well, I think, and this is something that we've worked really hard at at Elian. And um, from our perspective, the first step is realizing that if you're not intentional about your culture, it'll end up happening by default, uh, and it'll either be the voice of the of the loudest employee or or team member, or it'll be the the owner if that's the personality of the owner. And and at the end of the day, you'll rob the organization from really having an intentional personality that matches up with the purpose of the company. So for us, you know, step one was recognizing that you had to be intentional. Step two is defining it. You know, I, I, I see it a lot uh, akin to the development of an individual. Uh, I think you go through your teenage years, you don't even realize who you really are. You get to college, you kind of realize maybe what you want and you start to develop a, a personality. I think in the same way, an organization has to be evolved and you have to be open to the fact that you're evolving and, and looking at your values and maybe redefining them again. And, and in our case, um, we have devoted a tremendous amount of time and resources, whether it's uh, through different speakers we've invited, we do a corporate retreat every year where we take everybody off site and we spend a lot of time talking about the culture of the company and how does it match up to the values and how does it evolve? And something interesting that happened just organically, just to share anecdotally, is this thing called the Elian Way evolved, which we initially thought it was more of a set of values. It became really a methodology that we're giving more and more form to, and, and it's called TEW for short. And, and it's become a noun and a verb and an adjective all at once internally. And, and it really is something that everybody that works with us gets to know about it because it's sort of the measure by which we make decisions. How do we, we're in a tenant negotiation. What's the TEW way to handle this? Um, is somebody TEW as they're joining Elian Partners? And so it's, it's you got to be intentional. You have to be willing to evolve and you got to be self-aware enough to know that you don't know uh, and, that, and that you have to continue to learn and, and, and become hopefully better. Uh, I'm going to go to Jennifer as someone who is just, has just launched a, a company um, just a year ago during the pandemic. Um, what kind of choices did you make about being uh, intentional in, in your corporate culture? Right, so we uniquely were set up to be remote before the world was set up to be remote. And so um, it just so happened that we became lucky that nobody expected us to be in an office all together. So we've built a team of 10 people right now. I think it's first very intentional in who you're hiring. So, um, you know, hiring slow and deliberately um, and also building complementary perspectives. It doesn't help if everybody in the organization comes from the same point of view as you do. Um, it's really helpful to have perspectives in our case from different consulting organizations where our past experience lies and um, also from investment management practices and all of the areas that we're advising the investment managers on today. So I think, you know, first and foremost, it's about intentional hiring of, uh, of uh, diverse individuals um, in terms of the experience that they bring to the table. And then culture really, you know, we do a lot of um, collaboration on video. Um, I think there is this Zoom fatigue and Zoom exhaustion that is taking over all of our lives, but um, we are very communicative on Microsoft Teams and video. And uh, we actually brought in a business coach to advise our team. And we did unconscious bias and diversity training as a team as well. And some of those things are easier to do when you're remote and not in person altogether and others are, are more difficult. So um, it's still evolving uh, and we're just being deliberate about the vision that we want to create and the way we run, want to run our business and making sure the people we bring on board um, you know, sense that about the company. What, what are some challenges? You know, I think something that you mentioned earlier was about increasing diversity on the investment management committee. 
uh, and management committees, what are some of the challenges in that firms are facing in increasing their diversity and how might they address those challenges? Right. So um, this topic is, you know, how do you bring on diverse investment committee members or management committee members? I think our industry um, is so inclined to market or showcase the average total years of experience of the investment committee or, um, you know, other items to show a well tenured team with all of this experience of working together. Um, so it's viewed by investors and consultants as a competitive advantage. So it's not to my surprise that it doesn't change very often because the minute you introduce somebody with less experience, it brings down your averages. So I think that some questions that should be asked going forward is, um, is, there, is there a way that you could institute terms of investment committee members? It doesn't have to be every year. It could be even every five years. Um, is there a policy or procedure that outlines how you introduce new thoughts on investment committee or management committee? Or is it really just um, at the sole discretion of the senior leaders of the firm who may all look and talk and act alike? So I think just simply thinking a little bit differently about how we view the competitive advantages and that average years of experience together and think more inclusively about building a diverse and experienced team um, could go a long way. So I would start asking those questions. Great, and I, I do wanna remind the audience that if they have any questions for our panel, they can they can provide them. But I, I did wanna go over to Julie before, before I go through those. Um, do you wanna weigh in as well on the, the management and investment committee question? Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think, Jen, that's a great idea to put some kind of term limit on it, especially when you have a, a very seasoned team that has not changed in many, many years. I think that makes a lot of sense. And I think your point is spot on, that if you do add someone to the mix who has uh, less seniority, that, that they're afraid of the, the less years on the average. Um, but I will say that for us at CalSTRS, we, uh, our internal investment committee, it's open to our entire team. And we have everyone listening in and participating and asking questions. And we think the investment committee can be an incredible learning tool, especially for younger folks who can hear the debate and discussion and the pros and cons of uh, the actual investments that we're evaluating. So I think that you know, the industry as a whole might consider opening up their investment committee, not necessarily voting members, but instead of having it being cloistered to just five people or seven people, and it's the same senior people all the time, having more of a maybe a rotational basis as Jen described, or a term limit, if you will, so that you can have folks who are junior in the organization coming on and, and maybe you know, mentoring alongside senior folks in the investment committee so that there is diversity of thought and experience. We, we do recognize that more senior folks have had been through more than one business cycle and that's important in an investment committee. But I also think the viewpoints which you get from the junior staff is incredibly important and it's an amazing learning environment. So opening that up would be positive. Juan, do you have any uh, comments on investment committee or management committee? Uh, I, I, I love your comments, Julie, because it's something that we've done uh, sort of organically. We, we invite a lot of folks to participate in investment committee, not only because we want them to contribute, but also because they can hear uh, the thinking process. But I would say that one of the things that we are uh, most afraid of genuinely just have a very healthy source of respect uh, uh, for is groupthink. You know, we think that especially if you've been doing well, uh, it is very easy to develop uh, unconscious hubris where you think that you're just, everything's gonna go well. And uh, it is a very dangerous uh, uh, trend that can come into uh, an organization. And, you know, we have a saying internally that we like to say, keep the Kool-Aid in the freezer. Just, just, you know, just because things have gone well in the past doesn't mean they're gonna go well in the future. And and you can help to avoid that by uh, allowing more voices to be heard. And, and many times we'll put, put people on the spot and say, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? So that they can really realize that they can share their thoughts. And, and if anybody ever asks something they should have known, not make them feel like they should have known, but really just take the time to discuss the topic. And so it's not easy. It's a commitment of, of, of time and energy and you got to be patient when you're in the middle of the stress of trying to decide what to do to take the time to do that takes a real commitment from from everybody 
And I want to, um, I want to ask, you know, we talked a little bit about, about DEI and, you know, is, here's a question about DEI benchmarking, you know, is there, is there a benchmark that you're looking for? What, you know, when you, when you say, okay, this is what we're looking for. And I'm going to start this off with, with Julie and then Jen, you know, when you talk about the idea of a benchmark, is that even the right way to think about it? Is it, you know, or would you say it's more of a process? How do you how do you approach the idea of DEI benchmarking? I guess is my question for you, Julie. Yeah, you know, I think that ideally we wouldn't have to have a benchmark. It would just be part of the process, and and we would have a diverse investment pool. But I, I recognize the concept that we have to measure and have some baseline so that we can improve upon that. So I, I understand the background behind that. I would say for us at Calsters and the real estate team. You know, we recognize that CalSTRS generally makes larger equity commitments, and we don't want to drown a particular operator or a fund opportunity by virtue of the types of commitments that we need to make. So we, similar to the prior panel where there's Artemis, who works with larger funds, we have a group called Belay Investment Group, and they have just under $700 million of capital for us and they are specifically targeting emerging managers. Um, that's just one way that we reach out into the emerging manager space so that they have access to institutional capital so that they can build the track record and demonstrate to other institutional investors that they can be a standalone manager. So that helps to support the, the broader DEI universe overall. Um, I think that's just one way that we can start to have that baseline or benchmarking but if there was some uh, overall industry standard, that would be incredibly helpful to say, what does that look like? And how do we measure ourselves against this other standard? That's, you know, our emerging manager program is you know, a drop in the bucket, if you will, in terms of how we are accessing the space, but it, it, it's, it's movement forward and it's a way that we can be participating. I see you nodding as well, Jennifer. You wanna to touch, touch on this? Yeah, I get really excited about this because um, we approached a couple associations back in the summer of last year with the idea of collaborating on creating um, consistent data practices and benchmarking. So there are a couple underway that I specifically want to mention just for the benefit of those listening. Um, the first is the establishment of the CREA Foundation's Diversity Working Group. Um, so this group is specifically focused on um, understanding DEI initiatives in our industry and adjacent industries, um, mapping the initiatives, understanding how they're different, how they're similar, and um, establishing a framework for um, implementing standards and benchmarking in our industry. So it's early days. The group was just established, but um, the PREA Foundation, as Julie mentioned, does some great work with the SEO and other um, you know, other affiliations. And so I think this is one to watch out for. Um, the second is, I, I don't know if any of the audience members participated in NAREM's diversity um, survey. So in, in 2021, alongside Ferguson Partners, NAREM published a DNI survey, and they had about $2 trillion in gross assets under management represented and about 75 managers participating. Um, NAREM's 2022 efforts are um, now being conducted with a global intention and additional collaboration in the industry across the associations um, within investment management and commercial real estate, um, you know, is underway to provide better benchmarking, particularly for gender and ethnicity across organizations. So I think that's also one to work, watch out for that measures statistics over time, so over the duration of investment. And then the other one that I was really excited about um, is the Institutional Investing Diversity Cooperation um, Cooperative, the IIDC. Um, so this is um, a co-op that's been formed by the consultants um, to come together and collect through, by way of e-vestment, um, consistent statistics on diversity, equity, and inclusion to use during due diligence. So the members include Aon, Makita, NEPC, Milliman, um, Andco, Veris, Mercer, Callan, you name it. Um, the co-op has been formed exactly for this purpose to promote consistency of data collection and predominantly to be used during due diligence. So I think that those types of efforts um, transcend competition of who's going to get there first and who's going to do the best 
questionnaire when it comes to DEI and it promotes collaboration and more consistency and events baseline year. Uh, the, the consistency in data collection, um, there's a question from the audience that, that I think ties in that I'd like to share. Um, is this, this question stems from the idea floated earlier that it may be beneficial for some companies to put their diversity on display, but how do you avoid the company cherry picking the faces they put on display to appear more diverse in order to win business? So this is not this is not an industry this is not our industry alone right this happens everywhere colleges and universities through to businesses in every different industry so um you know what what i would suggest is that you start with succession planning and identifying the next generation of talent within your organization that you want to be investor facing and then you put them in front of the investors, you put them in front of the consultants, you give them additional responsibility. And that helps to kill two birds with one stone, succession planning and diversity, equity and inclusion and promoting them in a way that gives them more experience. So I, I do think there's a way to do it, but I also recognize that that's a challenge and um, it's not unique to our industry. I, I see you nodding, Julie. Yeah, I mean, that, that's always the challenge, right? And I think the only way you find out if, if a company is cherry picking and making the, the most diverse uh, org chart, going back to my prior comments, is digging in and doing your diligence. And if you find out that this person really has never worked on a real estate deal, but all of a sudden they're front and center in the pitch book, you know what's happening behind the scenes. <laughs> I see you nodding as well, Juan. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I just think that from the organization standpoint, you just got to make sure that you're being genuine and, and forthright with any questions, right? I think a good investor will, will do their diligence and will ask questions about uh, the person's involvement and also just interact with them and ask them hard questions. And you'll know whether or not they really are serving the role that is being proposed on the org chart. Um, so, so just the interaction directly with them and also asking for statistics. You know, we were... We had never really kept the statistic candidly until we went back to find out and we figured out we were 68% diverse in our leadership team and just numbers that that happened naturally without really pursuing them, but we had those ready to share with investors when the question came up. So those statistics should be readily available if an investor asks. And I, I wanna go back to Julia. You mentioned your, your emerging manager program how does that fit into to your, your broader DEI goals? You, you mentioned it allows you to, to access smaller firms. Is that part of the program? Absolutely. So it's just one uh, way that we interact with the emerging manager community. When we look at the real estate portfolio overall, as I mentioned, it's roughly $37 billion in value. Roughly $8 billion of that is invested with emerging managers. And we at CalSTRS define that as those managers with 1 billion or less of AUM and a maximum of 67% non-employee ownerships. So we want to make sure that those folks that are, uh, you know, in the trenches making the hard decisions are being compensated and are part of that uh, the equity and, and the promote with the, the team behind it. So that's just one way that we want to make sure our DEI goals are, you know, visible, not only to our constituents, but to the investors and the investment management industry as a whole. And, you know, our intention is to grow that. That's roughly 20% of our total portfolio in some shape or form, either a joint venture or a direct investment uh, is invested with those emerging managers. And we anticipate that growing over time. One of the one of the things that we talked about in this channel was how how DEI fits into ESG as part of the part of that movement. Um, and one of the things you know, a lot of a lot of organizations have drafted ESG policies. Um, have you or are you considering redrafting your ESG policies to include DEI as part of that um, as part of that policy? Um, this is for all any of you. Anyone want to weigh in? Jen? I can weigh in. Um, so we've advised, we've probably helped to draft or redraft about 10 different ESG policies over the last year. 
And in every single one of them, we are including a cross-reference to diversity, equity, and inclusion. I personally do believe DEI lives under the umbrella of ESG. It's not only good governance, um, but it's also um, a social aspect to consider if you have a diverse board or a diverse representation that better supports the makeup of your community or your investor base. So I think it does live in the umbrella of ESG, but meanwhile, we are encouraging and drafting separate DEI policies that are formally reviewed and overseen by senior management because that um, DEI does deserve senior leadership's attention. And if you just bury it in another policy and you never think about it and you never review your policies and procedures related to re recruitment and promotion and, and pay, then you, you could run the risk of, um, you know, kind of overlooking this space. So um, for us, it lives in ESG, but it's also separately um, its own policy and its own formal review process. Juan? Yeah, I'll jump in briefly. Uh, we, we do have a separate DEI policy, but like Jen alluded to, it is a part of the greater ESG umbrella. Uh, we do have a, a specific ESG DEI committee uh, that we established that has both uh, internal team members, uh, representation of the ownership of the company, as well as third party advisors uh, that, that serve uh, both from the governance standpoint, as well as the social aspect, and, and it includes the DEI. So that's the way that we've approached it. And, and so far, it seems to be working well. Uh, Julie, what are you looking for when it comes to either, you know, a DEI policy and an ESG policy? Is it something that you look for, for a firm to have one? Absolutely. It's one of our initial things we ask for in our DDQ. And, you know, at CalSTRS specifically, we also have it tied to the ESG policies, we also have a corporate governance group, sustainable investments and stewardship strategies. That is a mouthful, say that fast a few times. And uh, look at it for overall throughout CalSTRS. And you know, they have things that, uh, we have stronger corporate governance language that allows staff, for example, to take stronger action on proxy voting where boards lack diversity. So we have the benefit of the, the broader organization and this big group providing backup to the real estate team, but for us specifically, the DEI is part and parcel of that larger ESG umbrella, and we expect those managers that we invest with have similar policies and, and can articulate them and demonstrate it for us. I know we're we're going to be coming up pretty close on the on the close of the of the session, um, but I do want to create space if any of you have any additional comments um, or maybe want to to sort of provide some closing thoughts. So uh, I'll just sort of go around the group um, for, for those closing thoughts or additional comments you might have, you know, thinking about what you want the audience to, to take away from this event. You know, what, what measurement, you know, what thoughts do you want them to carry forward? What sort of takeaway do you want? Um, do you want the participants to take away from this? So I'll, I'll start over with you, Jen. Great, thank you. Um... You know, one thing, one common question that we're asked when um, our managers are out recruiting for senior level or, or even entry level positions is, will I be penalized if I choose not to hire a diverse candidate for this specific role? And I sort of want to play the role of myth buster here. That's not what this is about. If we're not, you know, the industry isn't saying to managers, you can't hire experienced people. What they're saying is you should recognize that experience exists across different and diverse communities and that you can build a diverse talent pool over time. So what I would say is that always look for diverse talent, but find the right talent for your organization. It will naturally come to the surface if you are intentional about it. So, um, you know, thank you for, for inviting me. And I learned a lot from Juan and Julie about your practices that we'll take forward. So appreciate that. And uh, Juan? Well, first of all, it's a, a bit surreal to be here, uh, having uh, overcome a lot of barriers to, to be able to, to start to speak to institutional investors. It's, it's really uh, a privilege, really, for Elian to be represented here and, and to be alongside Julie and Jen. It's, it's, a, it's a real honor. I mean that sincerely. Uh, I think the parting thought that I would, that I would leave for, for managers out there is, uh, if you make a true commitment to inclusion, to a culture of inclusion, um, it's going to lead to, to great results. And, and it might not be exactly the way that you anticipated. And, and I don't think to, to Jen's comment, it's not something necessarily that you target a specific number, 
Uh, it's more if you make that commitment internally, it'll it'll occur naturally, and and you won't have to reverse engineer yourself to look like an inclusive organization. So it takes self awareness. It's not easy, even for people that are minority owned. It's just it's something that you have to commit to and and live with every day. And uh, and Julie. Yeah, you know, I think it, this has been an incredible conversation. Thank you to everyone and the panelists. I, I've learned from you as well. You know, we've just wrapped up roughly two hours of conversation on DEI, including the prior panel. Um, what I'm hopeful is that we start to see where the rubber meets the road. We've been having these conversations for many years and I've been in the industry more than 20 years and we're still talking about the same thing. So I'm particularly excited for these benchmarking and these additional standardizations and questions that can really make it meaningful, not only make it clearer for the institutional investor, but for the managers who are responding so we can cut through the noise and just come up with best practices and make it really easy to measure and demonstrate how DEI is at your firm and how you perform financially, as well as you know, leaning in on your team. I think when that bubbles up and is very concise, then there's no stopping us. We're going to be able to move forward. But I would love to get past conversation and see some of these numbers change. Absolutely. You know, it, I hope that we have at least taken a small step toward toward creating a framework and, and creating some, some suggestions and maybe giving some tips to the audience, some ideas of how they might move forward with this. And I encourage everyone to keep the conversation moving. Uh, thank you again to Julie, to Jen, to Dwan. Thank you also to, to the first panel. Uh, this has been a very a very great conversation, very meaningful. Um, it's very special for IREI. We're, we're, we appreciate being, to ha being able to even host this. And uh, speaking of IREI, I want to turn the reins over to Jeffrey Dorman. Thank you, Loretta. Um, you know, truly an in interesting conversation, guys. Um, tons of great information. And, you know, I've been I'm involved in this business in one way or another for over 43 years. And it's amazing to me how much, how little I really know and how much I have to learn. And I learned a ton today. So thank you. Thanks again to, uh, to all of our panelists and most important to the sponsors who underwrite this program, uh, Artemis Real Estate Partners, Clarion Partners, Elion Partners, and Juniper Square. I'd also like to thank John Hunt and Randy Shine for assembling and preparing such a knowledgeable and experienced group of panelists and sponsors to Sandy Terranova and her team for developing the audience for the program and to Loretta for doing such a wonderful job as host and moderator, which she always does. Goodness gracious. Um, sorry about that. Um, just thinking about, um, well, as the panel discussions were progressing, uh, just something you'd be aware of, a white paper published by Deloitte on the some of the same issues the panelists were addressing showed up on my desktop. So if anybody's interested in receiving a link to that report, just let me know and I'll send it out to you. Um, after listening to uh, both sets of panel discussions, a number of things are pretty clear, I think. First is that this is not a new problem, as I noted in my introduction, but also because of all the benefits you stand to gain when you really do create a, a DEI friendly and encouraging environment. The problem also really presents a huge opportunity. And we talk a lot about the challenges of getting this in place and probably don't talk enough about the opportunity of just having an organization that is um, more diverse, that has greater equity shared throughout the organization that you know, really is more inclusive because of the policies and the beliefs that it holds. Um, the benefits that, that, that accrue to the organization are just uh, incredible. Um, in listening to everybody, it's, it seems to me that there really are two games that need to be played here when it comes to producing a more DEI friendly and encouraging environment. The first is a short term game. You know, what you can do to proactively promote improvements in diversity, equity, and inclusion in your organization right now. You know, again, putting up, not just talking about it. And, and the good news is, listening again to the panelists, is that the bar is pretty low. So any incremental improvement shouldn't be all that difficult to engineer. And you shouldn't look down on it. Geez, I can't make the whole thing happen all at once. Everybody understands that. But making incremental improvements every day can move you towards the goal that you, you're, you're outlining for yourselves. And if you really don't know where to start, again, there are organizations you can hire to help you jumpstart the development of sound policies and practices in this area. 
The second uh, game is a long-term game, much longer term. And you know what that really involves is uh, encouraging more women, more minorities, more people of all stripes and persuasions to seriously consider pursuing careers in the real estate investment management business or in the infrastructure business or in the real assets related uh, asset classes to basically enlarge the pool of viable candidates. And um, that has to start really early. I, I remember uh, not too long ago at a PREA meeting, Michelle Obama was the keynote and uh, really did a phenomenal job of articulating what we need to do. And she was invited because we were, the, the organization was focusing on um, its new initiatives uh, to, to uh, encourage diversity. And what she pointed out is the challenge is, is, is really reaching out to these people at very early stages in their lives, as early as grammar school, as well as reaching out to their parents to educate them all about the career opportunities that real estate infrastructure and other real asset classes present. You know, you got to capture people's minds and attentions early so they start focusing on and moving in the right direction. And something I hadn't been focusing on as part of the long-term game uh, involves not just recruiting, but also retaining women, minorities and others um, in your organizations, um, which also involves uh, involving them in your succession planning as well. And finally, I think the long-term game involves better identifying and acknowledging our, company, our own and organizational hidden biases, biases that we all have that um, really are inhibiting our ability to really move the needle in this critical area of performance. Um, so um, lots of things to come out of it. And um, I, I think this is one that you, a lot of us are gonna wanna go back and review and think about. Um, because it isn't something that most of us have been focusing on for our whole careers. Um, the good news is this session was recorded. So if you want to review it later, a link will be sent to you later this week or early next week where you can access it and view it online or download it to view later at your leisure. So thank you again to all of our panelists and sponsors, including Artemis Real Estate Partners, Clarion Partners, Elion Partners, Mosser Capital, and Juniper Square. Uh, can't thank you so much uh, or enough for the great job that you did. Thank you. And thank you all for tuning in and listening and posing your questions. It's always helpful to have interaction between the audience and, and the panelists. Thanks so much, everybody. Looking forward to the next one.